Okay, we are uh, still talking about pericyclic reactions, and I just want to give you our roadmap so you can see where we're at. Uh, we finished talking about cycloaddition reactions and ene reactions. These are both bimolecular processes where two things have to come together. And, and now we've started talking about unimolecular processes, intramolecular reactions. So we're almost done talking about electrocyclic reactions. It can be ring closure or ring opening. Um, and today we'll start on sigmatropic reactions where instead of having a full pi system, uh, we have to have at least one sigma bond in the transition state that's participating. Um, our exam is next Friday. It's going to cover all pericyclic reactions, so we should be able to finish that by uh, on Friday. So we'll be done with that. Um, and let me encourage you to work problems, not just the problems on the problem set. Uh, but there's two books that are useful for this class. This Fleming book, chapter six, is all pericyclic reactions, and there's bunches of problems in the back. Uh, Carrie and Sundberg, part A. Uh, in the fifth edition, chapter 10 is all pericyclic reactions, and the end of the chapter is full of problems. Uh, the, the fourth edition is online. Chapter 11 in the fourth edition is pericyclic reactions. Uh, so work those problems. Work as many problems as you can get your hands on, not just uh, the problems on the problem set. So let's keep talking about electrocyclic reactions. Uh, and we'll talk about three membered rings. And in particular, we're going to talk about azeridines. Three membered rings containing nitrogen because there's a lone pair on the nitrogen atom that can participate. So I'm going to, uh, I'll try to draw a structure of a zeridine and I'll give it two choices going left and right here. So here's uh, just a basic azeridine structure. Azeridine is like an epoxide. And there's a lone pair here on nitrogen. Our group is not so important here. And I'm going to put two substituents here on this zeridine ring. an arene and an ester. Uh, and we can track these choices here. So if we simply heat this, this can engage in an electrocyclic ring opening reaction. So we've got a sigma bond. And if we flatten this out, then this can be hybridized like a p orbital. That can be like a pi system. So if we make this lone pair participate, it can donate into this antibonding orbital, weaken this bond, and we can bring this over uh, in order to make, uh, actually, let me push the arrows in another, the opposite way. I apologize for that if you've already drawn that because I want to make it match my next structure. Um, let me push the arrows this way and I'll leave the electrons here on this carbon atom uh, and that'll give me the resonance structures that I drew. So I've got two arrows. There's four electrons in the transition state. Two electrons per arrow. So if it's four electrons, is that conrotatory or disrotatory? It's conrotatory. Uh, and I better make it conrotatory. And so you get this elytic structure. This is called an azomethine elid. And azomethionylates can do 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reactions. You can also treat these with light, and you can reverse the pericyclic selection rules. So if heating it gives you conrotatory ring opening, I'll just write con here, then uh, under photochemical conditions, you would expect that this would give you disrotatory ring opening. And so I, I'm not going to draw the other resonance structure, there, but there's partial double bond character here between this carbon and nitrogen that kind of gives you the equivalent of an E and Z geometry. So in the presence of, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and draw down here. If you put in some sort of a dipolarophile, like dimethylacetylene dicarboxylate, some sort of an activated, um, this is very nucleophilic, this azomethionylid. Um, if I put in an electrophilic, Dipolarophile, you can get 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reactions to occur. I'll just put E for ester here.
And so you can generate five membered rings. So two paracyclic reactants. This, it turns out, is not stable. And it will tautomerize with all of these carbonyls. The double bond wants to be more in conjugation with the, the nitrogen lone pair and a carbonyl. And so it's not really that interesting from the standpoint of paracyclic reactions. But um, this will tautomerize to an enamine. Uh, oh, actually, I've got that tautomerization on the wrong side. Sorry. Over here. So now even the benzene ring can be part of that conjugated system. Okay, so uh, three-membered rings can ring open through paracyclic processes that are governed by orbital symmetry, disrotatory, conrotatory. Let's take a look at a carbocyclic ring, a cyclopropane ring. I'll put a question mark there next to cations. <clears throat> I'm going to start off by trying to draw a three-membered ring um, kind of edge on. So we can kind of imagine, that way we can try to imagine substituents above and below the plane of the ring if I draw it in this distorted way. And I want to put a, a leaving group on here so we can imagine what will happen if that chloride pops out to give a cyclopropyl cation. This is not the kind of cyclopropane cation structure you're used to. You're used to carbocations next to cyclopropane rings, not inside of cyclopropane rings. Um, <clears throat> so if you heat this enough, let me add some substituents. I'm going to add two substituents on the top face so that we can keep track of disrotatory and conrotatory stuff. So I'll put two methyl groups on the top face. And then uh, let me try to make this look kind of three-dimensional there. And then we'll put some uh, H's on the bottom face uh, of this cyclopropane ring. Okay, so let's imagine what happens if we ionize to give a carbocation. So now we have an empty p orbital there. And so now if I push the electrons and do some sort of a ring opening, Really, I've only got one pair of electrons, and that's in this bond. It doesn't, it's kind of arbitrary which, uh, which, direction, I, which direction I push that arrow. So there's only two electrons. This is a two electron system. Is this disrotatory or conrotatory? It needs to be disrotatory. So over here with this system, we had a, a pair of electrons in this orbital. This is a four electron <coughs> ring opening. The cyclopropyl cation would be a two electron system. So if you're simply heating this without light, um, then you'd expect this to be disrotatory. And so the product that you get in this case, I'll draw the, the delocalized structure, it would look like this, which makes sense. That's sterically, that looks actually pretty good. I don't have any big steric issues. What's weird is that if you take this alternative isomer of this cyclopropane where the chloride is up on the same face of the methyl groups. Who would have thought that there'd be a, a difference here? Right? If this is really the mechanism that I drew, and I'm going to imply that maybe this is not the mechanism, but if this is really the mechanism, then it shouldn't matter which of these two chlorides I start with, because if they ionize, you'll end up with the same carbocation. And I'm simply going to tell you, I'll draw the product over here, that oddly, when you start with the other chloride, you get this other allylic carbocation. Why should it matter? Seems like you're generating the same chloride when this leaves. So in order to understand what's going on here, uh, you need to draw out the antibonding orbital for this and ask, what is it that makes that chloride leave? So let me go ahead and redraw this structure. Um, and, and what I'm going to try to do <coughs> is try to draw this in some sort of a distorted way that can help me see the tilting of these methyl groups. And so let's draw uh, why this chloride leaves. Let's draw this antibonding orbital for the carbon-chlorine bond. And, and I'll just sort of lightly sketch in that bond. I want to draw the antibonding orbital for the carbon-chlorine bond. Any donation into this antibonding orbital 
and I'll draw that in brilliant red. Here's the antibonding orbital back here. That's my sort of sketch. Anything that donates into that antibonding orbital is going to make that carbon chlorine actually leave uh, with greater facility. So, like this. It turns out that if you torque these methyl groups inward, and I'm going to try to super distort this in some sort of a freakish way, what happens is this bond starts to torque, and I'll try to draw, normally this bond is, is poking in between these two carbon atoms, but as, if, you, if you distort this molecule to twist those methyls inwards, then the orbitals that contribute to formation of that sigma bond will now start to bend downward. So if you twist these methyls inward, this sigma bond will sort of distort downward. And that allows the electron density in this bond to overlap with the antibonding orbital. In other words, this chloride will leave faster if you're torquing these methyl groups inward. And so uh, the point here is that you could cons still consider this paracyclic. This isn't a p orbital, it's an antibonding orbital. But the antibonding orbital has the same symmetry, pi-like symmetry, as, an, as a carbocation p orbital. It's got the same symmetry as this carbocation here. You know, there's orbital phasing above and below the plane. There's, you could draw out the, the phasing there. So <clears throat> you can't use carbocations to explain this result over here. You have to invoke a sigma star antibonding orbital instead of an empty p orbital. But you would still consider that to be a paracyclic process because, <coughs> because it obeys these properties of orbital symmetry. Okay, I want to come back to one last question here. And that is, what happens if there's something that prevents paracyclic processes from occurring? If you heat up molecules enough, they'll react in some way. And that doesn't always prove that it's a paracyclic process. Hey, yeah? Could you clarify what sigma orbitals are donating into that sigma star CL? So if I take a... If I take a carbon-carbon bond, let's make it meth, uh, ethane here. So if I take a carbon-carbon bond, you can imagine that this carbon-carbon bond arises from the interaction of two sp3-like hybrid orbitals combining together. You make carbon-carbon bonds by combining two sp... If you think about orbitals as tinker toys, this bond is composed of two sp3-like orbitals. That, that combine in a like phasing manner. And so if I distort these, if I take one of these H's or any substituent and I torque these up, these have to bend down. And so that's why, right, as I torque this in, these have to bend downward in response to that. So it's that kind of torquing here that's, that's bending that downward. Okay, so... Um, And what I'm talking about here is general. It's not just electrocyclic reactions. I'm going to try to draw out this uh, a molecule here called Dewar benzene. And I'm going to start by drawing a cyclobutene ring kind of edge on because I want to try to imagine uh, these two substituents here, they can be methyl groups, it doesn't matter, above the plane of the ring. And I'll draw the rest of this, uh, 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 this other ethylene bridge, ethene bridge, below the plane of the ring. So it's kind of like a benzene ring, here, if you kind of just look at the six atoms in the middle. Um, <clears throat> and in theory, all you have to do, if I get my red pen out here, is do an electrocyclic ring opening and then you can make benzene. So you can imagine there is a huge driving force, aromaticity, for ring opening to form benzene. The problem is this is a four electron process and if it's a four electron process it has to be conrotatory. And conrotatory means if I spin this group out of the benzene ring this other group also has to spin inward. There's no escaping that. 
And I promise you, you're not going to generate a benzene ring where one of the substituents is pointed inside the ring. I don't even know how to draw this. It's killing me here. So I'll just put that methyl group somehow inside the, right? There's no way you can do this. But that's not to say that this can't ring open. If you heat, in fact, <laughs> it doesn't take a lot, but it's very easy to open Dewar benzenes. If you take Dewar benzene and you simply heat it briefly at 100 degrees, it will form benzene or, or an arene ring, but it does it <coughs> through radical reactions. So what's happening here is it's popping open to give two radicals. And so this is a general feature of reactions. If you somehow prevent the orbital symmetry allowed process, you can still generate products, but it's usually through some sort of a diradical. And so now, and there's initially a spin. I'm not going to, we're not going to talk about spin uh, unless we can get to photochemistry in this class. <clears throat> but eventually this can reform a benzene ring. Okay, so if there's some orbital symmetry problem that prevents pericyclic reactions, Diels Alder reactions, sigmatropic reactions, ene like reactions, oftentimes you'll have radical, diradical, or if you've got the right <coughs> substituents that stabilize uh, ions, uh, ionic reactions, carbocations and carbanions. Okay, so um, that's it for, uh, for electrocyclic reactions. So let's totally switch gears now and let's talk about sigmatropic reactions. Okay, the nomenclature that we're going to use and that is commonly used for uh, sigmatropic reactions is based on atom fragments. So I'm going to start off with this canonical uh, sigmatropic rearrangement that involves a six-membered ring. It's called a cope rearrangement. <clears throat> and one way to think about this that will help you analyze anterofacial versus superfacial uh, stereochemical issues is to think about this as involving two three atom fragments. And let me add some numbering here so we can see what those two uh, three atom fragments are going to be. So when I draw the product of this, and you can do the arrow pushing in the reverse direction. I want to make sure this arrow ends on that carbon. I want to be really picky about that. I don't want you guys to make the arrows just end in open space because that doesn't represent uh, some sort of an antibonding orbital. Okay, so this would be called a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement. And the way to think about this is this, that this is uh, composed of two three-atom fragments. The numbering here, the, you know, what's one, two, and three is arbitrary. The point is I've got two fragments, each composed of three atoms. In, in, in the beginning, there's no bond here. In the beginning, there's a bond there. And then that's reversed in the product. And the point is that in the transition state, you have partial bonds between those two fragments. <clears throat> Let's take a look at a, um, a slightly different version of a sigmatropic rearrangement that involves also a six-membered ring. And what I need to imagine is I'm plucking off this, this proton and then giving those electrons back to this carbon system here. And we would call this uh, a 1-5 sigmatropic rearrangement. And if I follow my arrow pushing, it should look like that. Now the H is, a, is attached to that upper carbon instead of the lower carbon. And let's count the atom fragments. So there's a proton. In the transition state, there's partial bonding to the proton. 
So this proton is really just a one atom fragment. In the transition state, there's partial bonds to, to the proton. The other fragment is composed of five carbons that stay bonded throughout the entire course of this rearrangement. At no point are, are do you, there's at least some kind of bond between all five of these carbon atoms. This is, so this is a 1,5 sigmatropic rearrangement. And I could draw the reverse arrows. I'm not going to, for the backward reaction, I'm not going to do that. I'll just indicate that these are all reversible. <clears throat> Here's a very common uh, rearrangement that you, I think you saw a lot of last quarter. And that's carbocation shifts or hydride shifts. And so if I draw the arrow pushing here, I simply take the electrons. There's two electrons in this carbon carbon bond, and I donate those in the empty orbital. And if I number my fragments here, this two atom fragment on the bottom stays bonded the whole time. There's always a bond between one and two from, from going from starting material to product. Whereas this R group um, is my other one atom fragment. So this is a one two sigma trope. Uh, this is a one two sigma tropic rearrangement. You probably call it a one two shift, but that's a sigma tropic reaction. It obeys all of the pericyclic selection rules based on orbital symmetry that all of these other uh, sigma tropic reactions have to follow. Okay, there's another, uh, there's one more class of, Paris, uh, of, of rearrangement reactions. And there's still, it's not always clear what's going on in these reactions. Uh, I'll show you the, the, one of the most common examples of this. This is a sulfoxide, so we've talked a lot about sulfoxides, or sulfur chemistry. <clears throat> and this can undergo rearrangements quite facile rearrangements in which these atom fragments look like this. So there's an allylic uh, fragment and then there's this sulfoxide sulfenate, sulfenic ester fragment here. So there's always a sulfur oxygen bond from beginning to end and there's always um, all the carbon, all the carbons in the allyl fragment remain bonded from beginning to end. And so you can draw an arrow pushing reaction that looks like this. The problem with this, this is called a 2-3 rearrangement. The problem with this is nowhere in my mechanism, regardless of whether I push forward to, or, or backwards with my arrows, nowhere in my mechanism am I affecting the bonding between the oxygen and the sulfur. And if there's no interaction between the electrons on the oxygen and the electrons in the sulfur, then how can this be pericyclic? How can it involve a cyclic array of electrons? So there's some debate as to whether these are pericyclic. So I'll just write pericyclic. And in fact, if you, if you do the carbanion version of these, you can't find a pericyclic transition state unless you include a sixth atom somewhere. Um, so I'll just leave this as a question mark as to whether this, even though we, we will call it a 2-3 rearrangement, um, it's ambiguous as to whether that's a parasite process. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the simplest and most common version uh, of a sig sigmatropic rearrangement, and that's the all-carbon system with a six-membered transition state. And this will give us a chance to talk about stereochemistry. So 3-3 three, three rearrangements, 3-3 three, three sigmatropic rearrange, rearrangements prefer chair transition states. Over 11 kcals per mole. How many factors of 10 is that? Right, 1.4 kcals per mole is a factor of 10. 
I'm not that good at math, but you guys are good at that. Seven. seven. Ten to the seventh. So chair transition states ought to be faster than boat transition states by seven orders of magnitude. So you should expect huge selectivity for chair-like transition states. And then the next thing is kind of obvious. You want your substituents to be in axial, sorry, in, in equatorial over axial like orientations. So let's start off by, uh, I hope I'm going to have room here, so let me make sure I leave some room. I'm going to draw three structures over here for products on the board. So this would be an example of a substrate for a 3 3 sigma tropic rearrangement. You could push the, the arrows like this. That's not really the, the important aspect here. The important aspect is the transition state that leads to these three products. Maybe I should say two products. One of them you really don't see. So here's one product that you can generate. And here's a different product that you can generate. I think it's easier if I try start to draw an eight-membered ring, and you'll see why. It's not, it's not an eight-membered ring. I just want it to look. This, this makes it more easy to see that the alternative product has two cis double bonds instead of two trans double bonds. Now this, these have the same atom connectivity. It's just an issue of trans E versus cis, which is the Z geometry. And you can open to give either, either one or rearrange to give either one of those. And there's a third product here that you really don't see. And that would be the mixture of the cis and the trans. So the actual uh, ratios, if you run this reaction to low conversion before it has a chance to go backwards, right? This is an equilibrium reaction. <clears throat> what you'll find is that kinetically, um, you'll get a 90 to 10 ratio of the trans product versus the double cis product. And you get none of this, or at least none detectable, less than 1% of this mixed one where it's E and Z. So let's take a look at the transition states. I'm going to draw some, some chair and boat-like transition states here so we can see why uh, you'd expect this trans one to be favored. And so I'm um, just sort of lightly sketch a, a chair because we're going to erase some bonds here to make them partial bonds. I, I, can't, I don't know if I can lightly sketch with a pen here, but you can. This is the these are the bonds that are closer to us. And I want to really focus on, here's where I'm going to put my methyl groups in this transition state. Let me just try to make that a partial bond right there so you can kind of see where I'm coming from. <clears throat> and here's this other partial bond between these two. So here's one of the methyl groups. And the other methyl group would be here. Now how do we double check that I've drawn this correctly? Now, if it, if it really is a, a transition state, I should draw partial bonds uh, here for the pi bonds as I break and form them. I'm only going to do it for this first transition state because it makes it kind of complex. Right, in the transition state, I'm breaking this bond, this pi bond, and I'm forming a pi bond. And in the transition state, I'm, I'm making a pi bond and breaking this pi bond. So I can just use dashed lines everywhere. How do I check to make sure I've got the geometry right? What I want to do is I want to focus on, on the relationship here uh, between these H's to make sure I get this right. You can see that one methyl group on the chair is up, the other methyl group on the chair is down, and sorry I have to make this H bond long. Um, but in this transition state, this looks pretty good. Both of my methyl groups have equatorial dispositions here in this chair-like transition state. Um, but there's another chair-like transition state that I can draw I'm going to draw the ring flipped chair. And so you might want to sketch this lightly so you can erase one of the bonds. So I flip, right? The, you, you've got to draw the other flipped version of the chair here in order to make it match what I'm drawing. And I'm going to draw both of these methyl groups axial in this transition state. I don't think I need to go into much detail for you to, you should know that axial groups on six membered rings are disfavored. And here's the partial bond that I'm forming there. And I'm not going to draw all partial bonds. I'm just going to kind of draw the starting material and show a dashed line 
from forming a bond here. But this would be the alternative transition state conformation that looks like a chair. So I've got two chair possibilities, um, and I hope you can see that this is way better. Now, I just want to point at this, this atom right here and this atom right there. This is not really a chair. It's not a chair because there is no pure axial substituent at this position. And there's no pure equatorial substituent. And if there's no perfectly axial substituent, because this is sp2 instead of sp3, that means it's not as painful to have axial substituents in these transition states. Right? It's a 90-10 ratio. It's not 99 to 1. So you don't get, you know, having axial groups here is not quite as painful as it would be on a perfect cyclohexane where everything's sp3. Um, but it's still pretty painful. Okay, and then the last possible transition state is just a total non-starter here. I'm, just, I'm going to draw this, this boat-like transition state. And one of these methyl groups gets to be kind of pseudo-equatorial. The other methyl group has to be axial, but that's not the problem. The problem is that it's boat-like. Um, and so you see almost none of the, the product from the boat-like transition state. And so if you look at this here, this transition state, this boat-like transition state, see the two H's, they're anti? That's going to give you a trans double bond there. If you look at the two H's over here, they're cis. That's going to lead to the cis double bond. Sometimes if you can't keep track of whether you're, uh, of whether you're drawing the right isomers, look at the, the relative substituent. So let me come down here. These two H's are cis, and they're cis in the product. These two H's are, are cis to each other in the transition state. They better be cis in the product. So sometimes drawing the H's, which aren't drawn for you, will help you make sure you're keeping track of the geometry. And again, in this transition state, the two H's are trans, and here they're trans in the product. These two H's are trans to each other, and they're trans in the product. So that's kind of one of the big issues with, uh, with these 3 3 rearrangements is keeping track of double bond geometry and seeing how that correlates as you go from starting material to product. Okay, let's look at the orbitals that are involved in, in this, this simple 3-3 three, three sigma tropic rearrangement. And it's aggravating because as you look at one book versus another, they analyze the orbitals in different ways. It's so aggravating and it's going to confuse you. Let me try to resolve that confusion so we can try to see what's going on with this different type of orbital analysis. So if you look in the Carrion Sunberg book, um, the analysis is based on p orbital interactions. You take every single bond that's involved in the transition state and you try to uh, uh, break it down to look like a p orbital. So let me go ahead and draw out the uh, um, just the, the simple reaction without any orbitals. Let's just envision that we're talking about a 3-3 three, three sigma tropic rearrangement. And in that arrangement, this pi bond is attacking this other pi bond. This is giving its electrons over here, and you're breaking a sigma bond in the process. Three curved arrows, it's a six electron process. But you can try to imagine that this pi bond that's breaking here is actually composed of two p orbitals. You can imagine that this sigma bond is the interaction of two p-like orbitals that are poking end to end. And so let's break those bonds down to look like that. That's what Carrie and Sundberg does and other books. So let me go ahead and redraw that, um, that same transition state here. And I'm going to draw those p-like orbitals that are involved in the transition state. So over here, I'm going to take this, uh, that pi bond, and I'm going to draw two p-like orbitals and phase them so that they look like a pi bond. 
right, of those two p orbitals. With that phasing interact, you'll end up with a pi bond. And then over here, I'll take this other pi bond and do the same thing. On this one, I'll hash the bottom parts of these orbitals. And then the last bond is the sigma bond. <clears throat> and so how do I phase, how do I draw the p orbitals to make it look like a sigma bond? I'll put them end to end. That's kind of like the sigma bond there. And I'm going to hash the inside in between that's so the phasing. And now if I look at this, you know, if I've drawn, if I've correctly drawn these things so that they look like a sigma bond and a pi bond, whoops, and down here a pi bond, <coughs> I, I can arrange these so that there's a continuous overlap of like phased orbitals. See how all the hashed ones here interact? Top face, top face, top face of the allo fragment. And over here on the bottom face, I've got this sort of hashed, hashed, hashed. It works out beautifully. The orbital symmetry is perfect. And that's why you can rearrange uh, through these kinds of transition states in a 3-3. So uh, if you look at the Fleming book, of course, Fleming is all about frontier orbitals and canonical frontier molecular orbitals. Sigma, pi, p orbitals, lone pairs, sigma star, stuff like that. <clears throat> and so Fleming says, well, look, I'm not going to draw p orbitals. I know it's a pi bond, so why don't I just draw the pi bond? So if you look at the analysis in the Fleming book, you draw the same chair. That doesn't change. And then we'll just sketch out a, a pi-like orbital. Let me sketch it out. Here's a pi-like orbital. If two p orbitals combine together, you'll get a pi-like orbital out of that. And over here on, my, on the other side, I'm going to draw a, a pi-like orbital. This time I'm going to phase the bottom. Let me try to make this three-dimensional by showing that this bond is closer to us. There we go. That looks kind of like it's cl getting closer to us. Okay, and then finally the sigma, uh, the sigma bond, you've got electron density in between the two carbons, and then you've got unlike phasing on the back end here. Oh wait, let me, uh, let me change that so it's hashed in the middle. Okay, so now let's focus on this pi like, this three carbon fragment here, this allo fragment there. I don't know, it's, it's probably not so obvious here. Let me hide that behind there. So I've got this pi like orbital here, like the pi bond, and it's got the same phasing as this sigma bond. It can overlap on the top face of this allo fragment, um, <clears throat> I can get a constructive interaction between the top of this pi-like orbital and that sigma bond. And this sigma bond can interact with the bottom face of this pi bond, which can also interact with the top face. There's, I mean, there's a complete network of orbitals here that all have the symmetry matched, and it works perfectly. And it, it works perfectly because if the analysis worked here, it has to work there. Okay, there's a last way to analyze these things, and I don't have room underneath here, so I'll try to sketch it over here on the side. So the Fleming book does FMOs. Other books and other websites um, break these down in, into fragment radicals. In other words, it just fully breaks it down into two three-atom fragments. And so if this really is just two allyl radicals combining together, then all you have to do is understand what the orbitals look like for an allyl system. You just need to go back to Huckel theory and say, what does an allyl, what do the orbitals, what does the pi-like orbital look like for an allyl fragment? So here's one allyl fragment, and you'll recall from Huckel theory that an allyl fragment has this kind of phasing. There's a node in the middle, and all you really care about is the phasing on the end. Is it the same or opposite? Well, it's opposite. So on one carbon atom, it's hashed part up. On the other carbon atom, it's hashed part down. If we draw the other allo fragment in the orbital phasing, it's got to be the same, where hashed part is up on one side and down on the other side. And it's arbitrary, but we're going to choose the phasing combination. But I could have reversed this, but I'm going to choose the phasing combination where I'm going to have bonding. So these can interact. Sorry, I should have used the, the glorious red color here, but I forgot to do that. 
But you can see that there's a way to combine these so that the bottom face of one interacts with the top face of the other. I kind of like this, this depiction because it's simple. And because when we talk about rearrangements, I'm going to say three, three sigmatropic rearrangement. And I want you to focus on what's going on with the faces of those three atom fragments. So I kind of like this. So overall, why would you do these kinds of things? And the only reason that you're going to or analyze these, the orbitals here and the phasing um, is because you want to know whether the two fragments are acting anterofacially or suprafacially. So here, both of my bonds, and I, maybe it's, I don't know if that's obvious from my drawing here, but both of the bonds are coming from the bottom face of this allo fragment. That's suprafacial. And on this other fragment, both of the bonds are coming from the top face of that one. That's still superfacial. So this would be a superfacial, superfacial process. And that's not always the case. In a minute, I'm going to show you some cases where you'd have to dream up some pretty weird transition states uh, in order to access uh, anterofacial geometries. Okay, I kind of like that third because it seems simple. There's less stuff we have to draw on the paper. Right? If it's a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement, well, let me just draw a 3-carbon allo fragment. Okay, the utility of this suprafacial and terafacial business. I, I think it'll help if we draw out some, oh, some one n shifts. I'm just going to use that little integer number or whole number. So one, two shifts, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six. Let's talk about those. Everything is easy to envision when you talk about superfacial processes. Uh, I've got some sort of substituent on the top face and it just moves to a different atom on the same face. That's easy. It's, it's much harder to envision some process where a group is sticking up and then magically or mystically it somehow ends up on the bottom face. That's a lot harder to imagine. It's not impossible. Generally, superfacial um, ought to be easy. But what you'll find is it depends on whether it's 1, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 4, 1, 5, etc. And terafacial, conceptually, It ought to be implausible for typical ring sizes. I'll, I'll call them smaller rings. But are generally implausible if you talk about normal ring sizes like five-membered transition states, or six-membered ring transition states, or four-membered ring transition states. Let's try to take a look at some shifts. I'm going to draw a um, kind of edge on. I'm going to try to draw a, just propene, just so I can envision that there's two faces to this propene molecule. And I got a carbon-hydrogen bond here. And so what's the chance for this carbon-hydrogen bond to simply skip over and tautomerize? Right? It doesn't matter whether this is carbon-carbon or carbon-oxygen. Right? If I put an oxygen atom there, is this possible for me to tautomerize keto to enol in one step? Let me go ahead and draw the orbital analysis here. So this would be a 1-3 shift. And if I draw the orbitals for an allo fragment, for the three atom fragment, here's the orbital analysis for a three atom fragment. Remember there's a node in the middle. One end has got the hashed on the bottom, the other end has the hash on the top. What does the orbital look like for a hydrogen atom? Well remember there's no p orbitals with a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is a first row, it's just S. You got like a 1S orbital. So let me draw a 1S orbital. 
It's not sp3 or sp2. That's all I get. So yeah, you can have a bonding interaction here, but you cannot simultaneously have a bonding interaction with the top face of an allo fragment. It, it violates principles of orbital symmetry. There is no way you can simultaneously have bonding on the top face here and on the top face on the other end. That's why it doesn't matter whether it's propene or a, a carbonyl compound. You can't have one, three superfacial shifts with protons. You'd have to, the only way you could have some sort of one, three shift that's pericyclic is if it, is if the proton started on the top face and somehow ended up on the bottom. And quantum mechanically, maybe there's some tunneling argument why that might be possible, but that's just not plausible to draw 1-3 shifts um, of protons. That's completely implausible. Okay, let's take a look at another example. At a 1-5 shift. So now I'm going to struggle here to draw um, a pentadienyl system, kind of like a bit part of a benzene ring edge on, because I want to be able to see the different faces of that. And I want to be, I've got a five carbon system and I want to try to envision, maybe if I make these bonds longer, it'll make it more, um, more three dimensional. Okay, so there's a five carbon system. And let me add some double bonds so it looks like a pi system here. And then on this last carbon, I'm going to, to have a hydrogen atom poking onto the top face. And so let's try to imagine, is it possible for the H to jump over here onto this other carbon atom? And so maybe what I, I mean, I could draw the arrows, that's, that's no problem. It's easy to draw arrows to make it look like, right, I'm going to protonate this, this double bond on the end. It's always easy to draw the arrows. But the question is, does, does the orbital symmetry work out? Let me just write no here, right, the 1-3 the shift we, we agreed was just no way that was going to happen. Let me try to sketch out the orbitals for, a, right, this is just Huckel theory again. What does a pentadienyl system look like? Well, it looks like this. If I draw the orbitals for a pentadienyl system, there's two nodes here at carbons two and four. And if I look at the phasing for a pentadienyl system, the phasing on the two end carbons, and that's the ones we really care about, is the same. Hashed on the bottom, hashed on the bottom. Or you could arbitrarily draw it the other way, hashed on top. So with a pentadienyl system, with a five carbon pi system, the two end carbons have the same phasing on the top. And that means if I draw some sort of a hydrogen atom, as a 1s orbital, right, I can simultaneously have bonding between both of the end carbons on the same face. <clears throat> so the superfacial shift for a 1,3, totally implausible. But a superfacial 1,5 shift on the same face, no problem. One five shifts are very common in organic chemistry. Okay, let's keep going. And I'm going to have to, now you have to try to draw a stop sign here, I think is the easiest way. I'm gonna to try to figure out how to draw edge on uh, how do I do this? I'm going to try to draw seven carbons. Uh, I'm gonna, it's like an eight-membered ring. I'm just going to leave off one of these carbons. And then once again, I'm going to have this H atom jutting up on the top face so we can try to envision. Is it possible, right? The arrow, it's easy to draw arrows here. Look at this, just as easy as it was before. But the question is, is that allowed by principles of orbital symmetry? So let's, we've got a seven carbon system here. And what do the orbitals look like for a seven carbon system? We haven't spent a lot of time talking about that. <clears throat> so there's two nodes over here with the five carbon system. There's three nodes with the seven carbon system. And if I draw out this orbital phasing, it has to flip. There's one node, has to flip again. Now the hashing is on the bottom, has to flip again. And now the hashing is on the top. Let me try to make this sort of look three-dimensional here. 
because again, I'm trying to get this idea of faces across. So if I draw a hydrogen atom here, right, you, you can see the problem. If, if my hydrogen atom is, has bonding interactions over here, you can't, I'll just write no, you can't have a superfacial shift. There's no such thing as a superfacial 1-7 shift. That's totally implausible. But that's not to say that you couldn't shift this, like maybe there's some way to shift this to the bottom face. And we'll talk about that shortly. Actually, let me give you some examples now of how, what are the practical implications of this? Um, I guess I'll just mention a 1-2 shift is allowed by orbital symmetry, the carbocation shift. And how do I draw a carbocation shifting? So if I draw a carbocation shift, where a methyl group shifts, um, I would draw the two carbon system like a pi bond. A one two shift is allowed by orbital symmetry. Doesn't matter whether it's a hydride shift or an alkyl group shifting, the orbital phasing works out for a one two shift. Okay, so what's, what are the implications of this, of this allowed versus not allowed, or we would say symmetry allowed versus symmetry disallowed or forbidden? Okay, so here's one very simple implication. Thank God, one, three shifts are not allowed superfacially. So if you go into the lab and you synthesize some sort of an alkene, <clears throat> like this, you do not have to worry that these H's are going to dance around on your, on your substrate and shift the bonds around. Alkenes stay put. They don't just float around because of one, three shifts. That's totally implausible. <clears throat> the alternative is that uh, cyclopentadienyl systems with H's on them are extremely sensitive to isomerization. And so if you have some sort of an alkyl group there, you'll find that <clears throat> what happens is that that alkyl group will seem to move to different positions. It's not the alkyl group that's moving, it's the proton. Now it's possible that if your conditions are basic enough, you're deprotonating and reprotonating. This is very acidic. But even if you take all the base out, the H's will still migrate around through 1-5 shifts. And I'll draw the, the arrow pushing there. So it's very tricky to work with cyclo, substituted cyclopentadienes um, <clears throat> because they undergo 1-5 shifts with, with great facility. So that's very easy. I'll just write easy here. I don't have a, I'm gonna struggle here to draw out uh, vitamin D. It turns out, and this is totally strange, that vitamin D biosynthesis involves a 1-7 shift. And I'm going to try to draw, let me, you know, the easiest way to do this is to draw an eight-membered ring. So let me just draw an eight-membered ring, and I'm going to erase one of the bonds in my eight-membered ring. And here's the bond I'm going to erase up on top here. So vitamin D biosynthesis involves this kind of a 1-7 shift. And I'm not going to draw all the rest of the stuff here, but it, it's part of a steroid-like system. And if this is really going through a 1-7 shift, it can't be superfacial. We all agreed that it cannot be a superfacial shift. This is facile at room temperature. This is happening in your body, even in the dark. And I'm, what I'm going to try to do is try to draw what's happening here. This has to be anterofacial. Because the 1-7 superfacial shift is not allowed. If you want this H to start on the top face over here, it has to end up on the bottom face when it's done. And so you have to try to imagine some sort of a helical type. Gee, how do I do this? Let me try to draw this here. So I'm going to draw this like aloe fragmenteer. Then I'll have two atoms going up here and two atoms going down there. So that's my seven atom system. And then I'll try to imagine some sort of an H atom in between here. And in the transition state, it starts on the bottom face of one of these carbons. 
and it has to end up on the top face. And that's possible. So there's this sort of helical structure in which the bottom face of this and the top face of this are, are interacting. So one seven shifts are allowed, but it's got to be interfacial. It's possible you could have larger shifts, but as you get to larger ring sizes, one nine, one eight, it's just entropically hard to bring those ends together. So this is kind of, one seven is kind of unusual because you typically don't have the ends of one of seven carbon systems poised close to each other. Okay, so um, we'll try to finish up the, the sigmatropic stuff on, uh, on Friday. And our exam will cover through sigmatropic, uh, through all the paracyclic reactions.